that you're going to move tonight. Yes. We thank you that, that you call the, them from the east and the west and north and the south, Lord. Yes. We thank you that we're here to rebuild, restore, and raise up. Yes. A new generation, Father, your generation, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, my God. We bless you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen. Go around and greet somebody in the name of the Lord. Give them a high five. Go up with the Where are you at? Come on. Hey, come back to my brother. Hey, come back to my brother. my brothers. Good seeing you guys. Good, good, good. Camera guy. Boom squad's in the house tonight. All right, all right, all right. Glory to God. Come on. Glory to God. We want to welcome you out. You may be seated. We want to welcome you out to uh, the Alvarez Center Alumni Night. Come on. Where right. uh, men of God have, have come through this program and, and been groomed and continue to let God groom the, their lives. And, and, and they've gone on to live, uh, not to be a good citizen, but a godly citizen yeah. in the community. Yeah. Amen. How many know that, that we need godly men in the communities yeah. to make a difference? Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. First of all, I want to, I want to thank uh, Pastor David and Eileen uh, Ramirez for allowing us to have this event tonight. Yeah. We thank you so much for allowing us to do this. We welcome you out for uh, your know, first time out, out tonight. Amen. I, I, I want to say thank you to the Boom Squad, who's always... Come on! Always. I believe we got, we got a good, good uh, venue tonight. We've got five tremendous speakers. And they're going to they're gonna share uh, what God did in the program. What God continues to do in their lives as, they, as they've graduated and moved on in their lives and what God is continuing to do in their lives. Uh, uh, man, I, I want to let you know that this is not the last stop. Right. Uh, I said this is not the last stop. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I believe God has orchestrated this so that, that we can tell you that God has greater plans. Amen. Right. Amen. But let's get started now. I, I want to have Brother Gilbert Avila come up. He's going he's gonna to share. I haven't seen this guy. Brother Gilbert and I, we, we worked side by side running the home. I think I was getting in more trouble than, than helping him, but uh, appreciate you. Thank you for coming out. Amen, amen. Wow. This place brings back a lot of memories, man, I'm telling you. We built this stage right here for Pastor Danny. Come on. I don't know exactly where you guys are staying, but we used to stay in that place over there. Pastor Danny used to live in the house in the back. This is a divine invitation from God. Come on. Because let me tell you something. Friday nights I used to tune in when Pastor up here was talking, giving you guys a Bible study. And I tuned it into Facebook. And I sat there after like the third time I was watching, I said, Oh Lord, I'd like to go over there and give a testimony. I never said anything to, to Pastor. A week later, he's giving me a call saying, Hey, Gil, I wish I could come down. So I know that this is a divine invitation from the Lord. We're going to talk about when I got here, what I did here, and what I'm doing now. I was going to write down uh, what I wanted to say, but I just felt that God wants me to just share what's, what's, what he's got for me. I've been praying all week because I knew I was going to come. I didn't know I was going to hit so much traffic. Over two and a half, over two hours to get over here from the valleys. 
hot. But praise God because I love this place. Come on. Amen. This place changed my life. Come on. Come on. You are seeing a testimony of what God can do in your life. The Holy Spirit comes inside you, takes control, and guides you throughout. You guys right now are safe because you're on holy grounds. The battle starts when you leave here. That's good. You need to get plugged into a church, whether it be this church or wherever you guys come from, and stay plugged in. Because the battle is going to start when you guys go out these doors. Right now, you guys are holy ground. There ain't nothing but angels around here. I'm sure there's a few demons trying to get into your mind here. But once you pass out these doors, they're waiting for you. And, then, and they'll attack you. And they'll, they'll try to send you back into your old ways. I have a nephew who was in 11th grade when I was in this home. And he wrote a thesis for his class, and he wrote it about me. This is through the eyes of my nephew. This is the kind of person I was. <clears throat> and I'm gonna try to get this without getting emotional, but it's what God has done in my life. <clears throat> that I get emotional about. That's okay. Because this is what I used to be. I'm not like that anymore. Lord. <clears throat> Here we go. It was about two years and a half ago. My uncle was an alcoholic. <sighs> Trying to get his life back on track. I mean, he drank every day of every week of every year, just nonstop drinking. His life was in the gut of my family, was worried and all he could think about was alcohol. Myself and my family <clears throat> deeply believed his time was running out. We probably gave him about a month before he drank himself to death. I got a letter from him saying that <clears throat> he, was going to, uh, he was going to help and get his life back on track. I was thrilled to hear that, that news because he'd never, he, he lived inside the liquor bottle all his life. I was not used to hearing him say that he was going to quit drinking. He promised me and my family that he would never drink again. And to this day, about three years later, he has kept his promise. God worked a miracle because no one could come close and talking him out of drinking. The only person who could save his life was God. I say to myself, this is not the same person. Right now my uncle leads a worship team at his church in Whittier. He also is in charge of a men's home for men who are trying to get their lives straight now. The only way The only way you can look at this is on God's terms. God made this possible. God saved his life. God had a plan for him and what the plan it was. Not only did God save my uncle's life, but he also saved the lives of every man, every single guy in that home. And he did it through my uncle. That was God's plan for my uncle. He helped those who were just like him or worse. My uncle dedicated his life to God, listens to Christian music, reads his Bible every day, takes his Bible everywhere he goes. It's, it's just a miracle. He constantly thanks God for saving his life. This past summer I stayed with my uncle for a week. <clears throat> we hung out, went to movies, played basketball, and went to Wednesday, Friday, and Sunday service. That was awesome. We used to go Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays. Yeah. Get the guys ready in the band. <laughs> During my stay, I learned more about God and my uncle than, I, than ever before. It just left me 
in complete state of shock that this was the same man who drank his his life almost to an early death. I should say it was not the same guy, but a resurrection one. It's good. Uh -huh. This was a man who was letting demons run his life and not living the life God had planned for. My uncle should be playing in the NBA, but I think he's being calm there. He's a, he's a great basketball player and still is. Every time we played against each other, I could see, I couldn't seem to outplay him. He just kept coming and coming and coming. He would never quit. I also learned that he is in total peace with himself, whereas when he was an alcoholic, he was a mean and crazy person. This is why he must see this on God's terms only. On human terms, people would look and say, oh, this is just another guy trying to get his life back on track. Every now and then, my family, every now, me and my family, on uh, every other Sunday, will go to Whittier and visit him and, and uh, Sunday service. Every time we see him, we are left with total amazement that this, that we are seeing a miracle right in front of us. I just thank God for what he has done for my uncle. Because without God coming into his life, my uncle would most definitely be dead. Now I have another uncle in the same home who has the same problem as my uncle that has been taking, talking about, that, I, that he's been talking about. So now I, I can say God has worked miracles and God has worked two miracles and for that I'm forever grateful. It's, 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 it's strange to see my, my nephew use words like God, God did this and demons. He, he never knew anything about that until he came and visited us. So I came here and I came from a, a Rehabilitation Center. I don't know if anybody's familiar with Warm Springs. It's in Cascade, going up the 5 Freeway. And it's a alcohol, drug addict, you know, they got NA, C, uh, CA, all those programs. And uh, I've been there before, and that place kept me sober for one year, and then I'd go back to drinking. So this last trip that I was up there, I shared a dorm with about 20 guys, maybe more, and we all shared the same restroom. And there was this guy in there, his name was Rich, he worked for the city of uh, LA County, and he was remodeling the restrooms. So I eventually went in there and introduced myself, and I told him about my problems and this and that, and I told him that I was going to really, really change my life this time. I was really gonna stay sober. Uh, I mean, I'm already like 38 years old. I mean, I didn't have much longer to, to go. So, uh, he, he looked at me and goes, because I told him, I go, I'm gonna go live in a living sober home. He goes, you don't need living sober home. He goes, you need Jesus. He goes, you don't need this hill. You need Jesus in your life. And I go, I'm like, well, what are you talking about? He goes, find yourself a Christian home. And I go, a Christian home, what's that? He goes. Go to the, 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 the office, they got a directory, and you can find a Christian home. There you'll study the Word, there you'll live with those guys. And once you get there, don't be a bench warmer, get involved, he said. That's good. Come on. <laughs> so, I went up to the office, I looked at the book, and I seen Whittier. I think it was called New Hope, I think, I'm not sure. Yeah. New Hope yeah. Christian Fellowship Men's Home. And I said to myself, I'm gonna go there because if it doesn't work, I can walk to Bassett and know those guys will take me back in a heartbeat. Okay? I grew up in Bassett, wasn't far from here, so I figured I'd give it a shot. I'm here three months and I spent three months in the mall, so I got six months of staying away from booze. And 
My nephew only knows about the booze. He doesn't know about the coke. He doesn't know about the meth. He doesn't know about the speed I was doing. I was doing all that crap. He just thought it was just alcohol. But alcohol was keeping me up, I guess. I don't know. Anyway, so I get here and I do, I'm on my third month. And like he was, he was saying that my family would come every other weekend, come and visit. And one, that one Sunday, my dad came up to me and he goes, hey Gil, you wanna come home, you can come home. Here I am, 38 years old, my dad said I can come back to the house. Or I've been abusing him, abusing his money, abusing his vehicles. My dad's grabbing his cars up out of the empire, I don't know how many times. I think it was three times in one month. So once my dad said that, he had planted that seed that I can go home. So I thought about it all week. So the following Sunday, I said, you know what? I got this figured out. I'm going to go home, you know? That Sunday morning, I'm trying to build up some courage to go to Pastor Danny's office and let him know, you know what? I'm leaving. When one of the directors came up to me and says, hey, Pastor wants to see you. So I said, oh, good. Now I know this from God because <laughs> you know? Bring it on. So I go, go to the office and uh, I go, Pastor, I got something I need to tell you. He goes, what's that? He goes, I'm going to leave after service today. He goes, what? He goes, yeah. Uh, I go, yeah, you know, my dad said I go home and blah, blah, blah. And Pastor goes, no, you're not ready to go home. I go, well, I feel like I'm ready. He goes, no. He goes, I brought you in here because I need I need your help here. I go, what? He goes, I need your help. He goes, the guys have been talking highly about you, the directors and the guys that are running this place, and we'd like you to be an usher. I go, I'm not sure. <laughs> I ain't gonna be no usher. I didn't come here to be an usher. I came here to learn about the word, and I think I got it. He goes, Gil, you don't have nothing? Be an usher, and that's part of the word. So I go, okay, Dan, I go, Pastor Danny, I'll give it a chance. I'll give it a shot. Well, after that day, I stayed here three years. Oh, wow. Come on. After that, I took over the ministry of being an usher. After that, Pastor asked me to run the men's home. He had put me, he had brought in a trailer, put my little house in the back. I lived back there, ran the home. Pastor Danny was grooming me to be a preacher, but I knew I had too much luggage in mine, too much stuff in the closet. He would take me everywhere. He would take me to pastor's meetings, conferences and everything. He let me preach a couple times on a Wednesday night, but you know what you're calling. If, if you're called to preach the word, you're going to preach the word. And I felt that that wasn't my calling. So I asked him, I'd like to get a job. You know, I, I need to get some money. He goes, go find a job. You know, he goes, as a matter of fact, I'm going to get a little room right here. There was a, a family, I don't know their last name, but Maria and Angel. Yeah. Their parents lived right down the street and they had a house in the back. And he goes, I'm working on getting that house back there for you. The only thing I need is for you to take three guys with you that you can groom them up. I go, all right, I'll, I'll do that. He goes, go ahead and find a job. Basically, I can leave and come and go whenever I want. So what does the Lord do? He opens the door at Budweiser. <laughs> start working for Budweiser. There's a distribution center over here, not too far from here, because I used to ride my bike over there. And there I am, and in this freezer full of beer. And I see these guys, they're, they're, getting, they're getting a buzz while they're working. They're going in the restroom and they're drinking. And I'm going, isn't this amazing, man? God, what? <laughs> what God have a humor or what, man? So, I, uh, we, we used to have like uh, meetings 
And I kind of like read the meetings over there. They were amazed at stuff that was coming out of my mouth. I was amazed. But I knew it was God. God had just put words in my mouth to speak to these guys. They knew I wasn't drinking. They knew I was a Christian. They knew I lived in a home. And they just leave me alone, and, you know. And come Christmas time, they would give out cases of beer to everybody. I go, just give me a case of water. So I held on to that job for a little bit, and then um, just helping pastor as much as I can, you know. And I know that without the power of the Holy Spirit, I wouldn't have been able to do anything. Else. That's good. Because one Sunday morning, pastor, I would come in here. Make sure everything's in order. Make sure the men are ready to go. And pastor calls me to the office. And I used to go in there and I used to pray for him and ask him if he's ready. And he, I walk in and I go, what's up, pastor? He goes, you're leading worship today. I go, what? He goes, you're going to lead worship today. I go, you got to be kidding me. I'm not going to lead worship. He goes, yo, Joey and Veronica are having a little problem. I need you to be worship. I go, you're serious? He goes, yeah. I go, I can't do this. He goes, I know you can't. But the Holy Spirit that's in you go is going to provide the power that you need. <laughs> so I come out of the office, and his wife is up here, and the band's practicing. Now Nadine, she's got a beautiful voice. She can lead worship. So I walk up here, I go, Nadine, Pastor wants me to lead worship. She didn't even blink an eye. She goes, okay, here's the songs we're going to do. And I told, I told Pastor, I go, Pastor, I don't know these songs. He goes, you know, like uh, two weeks before that, we're at the park over here. And he tells me, you know, get on top of the tables and start leading everybody with songs and stuff. So I jumped up there because I know after so many years, you know, all these songs, you know, you know so we're, I let him the song. He goes, you can do it. I never felt the power of the Holy Spirit Come on. like I did when I was up here worshiping. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was a time that I just put the mic down and just fell down to the ground and just started weeping. That, that, the power was just so overwhelming. It was unbelievable. So, like Pastor was saying, this is just the beginning, guys. I know there's, there's guys in here that are struggling and are thinking about leaving, but the best thing you can do in your life is to stay, to stick it out. And to get plugged in when you do leave into a church or whether it be this church right here. Because I'm telling you, when I came through these doors, I had nothing. I had nothing. And the best thing, besides my salvation and the way uh, my family has changed their lives, <coughs> the day when my wife walked through those doors <coughs> my brother told me he goes there's a girl in my office that I want you to meet and I told him if she wants to meet me you tell her to show up at church on Sunday morning yeah oh, come yeah on. so he, he came and goes she's gonna be here she's gonna be here so I was leading worship and I was looking right through the doors I knew practically everybody <coughs> And I didn't see no young face come by through here. And service started. So my brother came up to me after service. He goes, I don't know what happened. I don't know what happened. I go, I don't, don't worry about it. I ain't worried about it. I mean, I was praying for two years that God would provide me with somebody. But it didn't matter to me. Because I was so in love with Jesus that that's all I really needed. That's right. That's good. Wow. So... During the week, he calls me up and he says, hey, uh, she's going to be there this Sunday. She got lost. I go, she got lost? <laughs> she, she lives in the valley. We live in the valley. I go, it's a five freeway. Get up on Carmenita, turn it up on Meyer. It's the only church here. What do you mean she got lost? What are you trying to set me up with, man? <laughs> he goes, she's going to be there. She's going to be there. And she is a gift from God, you guys. I'm telling you. That's good. This woman is educated, well-read, and well-traveled. And there's been times, and I've been married 20 years now. Hallelujah. And uh, there's been times uh, in our relationship, and it hasn't been a blitz marriage, believe me, okay? 
Anybody think that's when you get married, everything's going to be peaches and roses? That's uh, you're, you're going to learn. You know? But it's God that helps you stay together. If it wasn't for God, I would have left a long time ago, or she would have left a long time ago. So we were, we were talking one day, and she goes, you know, man, I wish I would have met you a long time ago. And I go, no, you don't. No, you don't. Because all I did was abuse women, abuse friends, abuse family. You know, it, I wasn't the person that I am today, you know. And it's only through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's good. Through the blood of Jesus That's Christ. Right. Come on. That has changed me. It's transferred my mind, my speech. It just made me a whole different person. Like I said, I walked in these doors, I, don't, I didn't have nothing. We were $50,000 away from owning our own home. I have more money in the bank right now than I've ever had in my life. And it's all because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's that's good. Yeah. So, we were together not even six months and we got married. And uh, I told Pastor, I go, hey, we're going to get married. He goes, what? I go, we're going to get married. He goes, you got to, no, you got to bring her in. We got to talk about this. So I brought, brought her to the office and he told her, uh, I think it was three or two things. One, he loves Jesus. Two, he loves the Lakers. Three, he's involved in church. If you can hang on to those three, you got a good guy right here. So we got married, and she had just purchased the house that we live in right now uh, out in the San Fernando Valley. And uh, I tried coming on Wednesday nights and Sundays, and it just got too much for me. And I went, went into Pastor Danny and I go, hey, Pastor, I, I can't, I got to leave the church. I got to find something over there. He goes, oh, I knew this day was coming, Gil. But, uh, yeah, you find the church, stay plugged in. So I went to a Christian bookstore over there in the valley. And I walked into the place and I told the guy I'm looking for a church. And preferably a four-square church. He goes, oh, I, I can send you a mega church. There's a church on the way, Jack Hayford. And I go, no, no, no. I want a small church where I can get involved and just be part of it. He goes, oh, well, there's a church right around the corner from here. So I went one Sunday, visit the church, and I said, wow, it's good enough for me. We've been in that church for 19 years now. We've been in that church. That's good. Here you go. We went there, and we got involved. I just didn't go there just to sit on Sundays. I told the pastor, I want to get a hold of these men. We're going to have Bible studies at my house. I used to get all the men. We used to gather at my house in the garage and have Bible studies once a week. Me and my wife got involved in the children's ministry. Where we seen these kids from this to this and married, got, get married and they took off. That's good. You know, that's one thing you got to do is get involved in the church and stay plugged in. Yes. I've had reasons to leave that church, believe me. Because I'm already on my, I think, fourth pastor or something. Wow. The first one was a major, major shock to me. Because I got a call from the, the secretary that says, you need to come over here right now. I'm reporting this pastor. I go, wait, what are you talking about? And I was just leaving. I was just getting my car to leave. He's spending money that's not his. I go, well, wait, wait, you can't do that. You, you got to hold on. You can't go by yourself. Well, I'm leaving. Go. If you can't be here, I'm going. So anyway, she reported them. Uh, I think it was that night or the next day, I called Pastor Danny. I asked Pastor Danny, here's what's going on. He goes, Gil, stand by here, Pastor. If she said, if it's true what he said, what she says, God will rebuild it, okay? But stay with him. So we would have meetings with him and, and, and ask him, hey, are you having problems with money? You know, just come clean. Scratch it, we'll, you know, start over. But he denied it. Well, he finally, they finally took his license away and everything, and, and that was it. And I was thinking, man, boy, I should just leave. I don't need to put up with this. Because I was involved in the board, you know. I, I got picked to be a board member. And when the superintendent from Forsberg came, we got chewed out. The board people got chewed out for not being more diligent, more vigil where the money is going. And that's when I said, you know what, I don't need this. I'll just go to church on my way. Just go on Sundays and come. But God kept me there. And I'm there today. 
I got a new pastor. I love this guy. I'm there every Sunday morning at 8 o'clock. Service don't start until 9.30. I'm making sure that things are in order inside the sanctuary. That's good. Uh, that's something that I picked up here at this home. You know, being obedient and being a service, not being a bench warmer. So, I want to thank Pastor for asking me to come out here and share this. Uh, I hope and pray that you guys will, all of you guys will benefit from what, what God wants to do in your life. God will change your life completely around. It might not look like it right now. You might want it like next week or next year. You got to be patient and God will deliver you everything. Amen. Thank you guys.
you know, he's still tolerating me, I'm still, you know, getting his butt, right? I'm still tolerating me. But what I learned from his home was uh, just keep the Lord in your heart at all times. You know, his way is always the best way. That's right. And it oh, yes. um, doesn't feel right, if your heart feels that it's right, it's all matters. Just do it. Um, like I said, I'm going on six years without alcohol, met COVID, oh. all that stuff, and oh. 12 years. Okay. My problem is alcohol. Waking up to it, going to bed to it. Not no more. It's, it's great. It's, it's a good feeling to wake up in the morning not having that. But I learned that from here, from this home. If you let the home, don't fight it. Just work with it. It 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 does it does work. It does work. As stubborn as I am, I used to be stubborn. Uh, you know, just surrender and just do the right way. Do God's way, and it'll work. It'll work out. And, but uh, what it's done for me now, the job I have now, the guy gave me a chance to drop a strike again. After he fired me twice because of my alcohol, wow. he offered me a position. But my, he put down the down payment for the truck for me as my own truck. Wow. And it's a blessing. Wow. blessing. Here we are. That's and, good. Uh, and uh, and uh, it says it's a blessing to have my wife back, my kids back, I got two grandkids now. It's just. Life couldn't be better, you know. I wake up every morning with joy instead of hurting for the alcohol, wanting alcohol. You know, don't miss that. We get to see my kids in the morning, my wife in the morning. Not to get your brother, but I see you too. But <laughs> it's nice to see my, my wife too, the Lordy. <laughs> and uh, that's all I really have to say. You know, I just thank you for this home, thank you for the Lord. And, uh, Thank you for that for me. Pastor Mark, come on up. Come on, Pastor Mark. Preach. Preach, Pastor Mark. Preach. Are you enjoying this? Yeah. All right. God is good. Amen. Come on. We can do better than that. You know, um, to be honest with you, uh, and I was sharing this while ago, I, I kind of struggle with testimonies. And, and, and the reason I struggle with them is I don't want to say that, that I'm ashamed of, of uh, uh, who I am or, or what the Lord's done in my life. Because I don't want to give the devil no glory. <laughs> I don't, man, you know, because, because all the devil's ever done in my life was try to destroy it, try to kill me. Try, you know, just, just try to take me to hell, basically. But uh, uh, I know this. Uh, testimonies are biblical, though. And, and uh, I want to thank Richard for, for challenging me to share a testimony. But uh, I want to share briefly, though. Uh, if you want to read about a testimony, go to the book of Acts. So you don't have to go there now for the sake of time. Because if you give me a mic, you might be here tomorrow morning. <laughs> no, that's your fault. <laughs> But in the book of Acts, chapter 26, the apostle Paul, he finds himself in front of Agrippa. Yeah. And he starts to share. And I love it because he speaks and he says, you know, uh, Agrippa tells Paul, you may speak and, and, and defend yourself. Yeah. And basically what Paul does is he goes on and he starts speaking about his upbringing, how he was brought up in Jewish law. And, and, and uh, you know, he, he considered it a joy to, to persecute believers and, and, and you know, just and he got permission to kill them, basically. And, and I know this, you know, that the enemy, he wants to do that. He, he wants to kill, steal, and destroy. He, and, you know, and everything that's good in my life has happened to me since I gave my life to the Lord. But as Apostle Paul, he goes on and he begins to share, you know, his upbringing and, and how, how he persecuted Christians and all that. And then one day he, go, he goes to the king and he even gets permission to go and persecute Christians. And then he goes on to say that one day he was on a road to Damascus and, 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 and God just appeared to him. And ever since that day, the apostle Paul 
has never been the same. Just like ever since, and I, you know, I had my own road to Damascus, I've never been the same. You know, and, and I say that because we need to be, there, there's power in the testimony. You know, but, but I always want to be careful because I always want to give the Lord the glory. Because, you know, I'm not ashamed of, of, of uh, what I come from because I know this. What I come from made me the man of God I am today. Yeah, that's right. That's good. You, you hear me? What I come from made me the man of God I am today. And, and I love it because, you know, as the Apostle Paul is speaking, uh, uh, the king tells him, you know, basically tells him, shut up. He tells him, you know, you think that all this elegant speech you're saying and, and all this education you're trying to, you know, say to us is, is going to make us change our views or, or our beliefs and all that. And I love uh, uh, Paul's reply. Paul replied, he says this in, in Acts uh, chapter, what I just said anyway, verse 20, it says, Paul replied, whether quickly or not, I pray to God that both you and everyone here in this audience might become the same as I am, except for these chains. See, and he realized something. There's there's power in the testimony. Yes. So I want to share my testimony a little bit today. You know, because I, I too, like a lot of you here, started at a young age. I started, you know, at 13 years old. I remember the uh, first thing I got introduced to, like everybody else, was probably alcohol. <coughs> and and uh, 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 I'll be honest, when I drank alcohol, I didn't like it. And I remember I was 13 years old and somebody introduced me to PCP. And I remember smoking PCP, and, and I said, man, I died and gone to heaven. I thought I was on heaven on earth. You know, but, but I realized something at a young age. I was always trying to fill a void. Because I was brought up in a family that was very dysfunctional. My family, it was, it was normal for me to sit there and get high with my father. I, I remember the, uh, one night when, when, uh, when I smoked PCP, and I, and I shared this before, that uh, I came home and, and I freaked out. And, and I remember when I woke up, my father had me in the shower. I was fully dressed and, and you know, he was being the best dad that he could be. You know, in his mind, he, he was protecting me. And when I, when I came out of it, you know, I just came out of it, went and put some dry clothes on, went to bed and in the morning. This is my father's father's son talked to me. He handed me a bag of marijuana. And he told me, don't smoke that, smoke this. But in his mind, he was doing good. So I, you know, but I was always trying to fill a, fill a void, you know, from either smoking marijuana or smoking PCP, sniffing pain, trying a little bit of LSD, smoking some cocaine, starting some cocaine. I even doubled in heroin a little bit. I, I smoked some methamphetamine. I started smoking meth and started snorting meth. I did all that. But I realized something. I did all that because I was looking to be accepted. See, and I think if we're honest with ourselves, we all want to be accepted. But there's a song that goes like this, looking for love in all the wrong places. And I believe I, I was looking for love or, or I was looking for acceptance in all the wrong places. I didn't want to be the only guy that was different in the neighborhood. I didn't want to be the only guy that said no. I didn't want to be the guy that, that, that seemed like that. You know what? Uh, I wasn't mad enough to, to get high or whatever. How many of you know this? That it takes a real man of God to say no to something. Amen. 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 It takes a man to say, you know, I don't care what you think about me. Come on. That's right. Come uh, on. You guys ain't hearing this, man. Yeah. You know, it's Come easy to give in to temptation. Matter of fact, it's natural to give in to temptation. But I said, you know what? I still had a void. And I was always trying to fill that void with the substance. But in reality, the choices that I was making, they were only creating more voids. Because as I began to grow older and all that, and, and being a young man and all that, I found out that, that everything that I wanted, that acceptance and, and, and wanting to be liked and wanting to be a part of something, wanting to be part of a family, wanting to have a family and all that, my substance use was taking me away from all that. And what did I do? I, I continued to to use more and more to try to fill that void and, and it seems like the more I use the bigger the void got the more I use the bigger hole I found myself in and then I remember one day I, I, I had my, my first road to Damascus experience that's what I want to call it I remember coming here uh, 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 I'll be honest uh, Brother Gilbert and you told me the same thing before I didn't like you when you were first here 
I didn't. I didn't like Richard when he was first here. I remember my father used to be here and he used to help run the home too and he used to stay in that trade. I think you guys were roommates for a while there, right? And, and, and um, I used to come over here because so I was staying down the street and, and uh, try to ask my dad for a few bucks or whatever and all that. And, and, and um, I remember coming over to see my dad and I always felt a sense of peace here. But I didn't like the people here because I knew if I liked them, then something was wrong with me. I needed to change, amen? Yeah. Because somebody know that, that void that, that I created all the time, the way I separated myself from everything, was substances, it was, it was blinding me from true happiness. That's wow. wow. good. It, it was. It, yeah. it, you know what? Getting high is fun, but it, 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 it's miserable. Right. Yes. It's yeah. miserable, amen? Wow. And I remember, I remember one day, and I shared this, I shared this many times behind the pulpit. One day I was standing in the garage down the street because I was in my 20s, probably closer to my 30s now, and, and still not having nowhere to go, still trying to come over here and bum a few bucks off my father or, or my mother whenever she was around here because she was staying with my sister, a matter of fact, at that time, Pastor Danny. And, and um, I was always trying to uh, do something. And I remember one day I was in the garage and, 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 and I was filling that void, so I thought. And, and I began to, to get high, and I was getting high in there, and, and uh, I, I had a vision. I had my first vision of my life, and, and this was my vision, and I shared it before. I got old in that garage. I remember seeing myself shriveled and old, like, you know, like, like, like Mr. Magoo. I was really old, and in my vision, I was old. And, and I, I couldn't stay in there. I couldn't breathe. I remember I was sitting in that garage, and, and I couldn't breathe. It was in 1996. And I remember I, I had to run out of that garage, and, and I ran out of the garage, and I was saying I was right down the street. The front doors of the church were open, and the Lord spoke to me. And I didn't realize at the time, though, but he told me, that's where you're going to fill that void. That's, that's where, where, you know what, what you're looking for, that's where it is. And I knew everybody in the church. Like, uh, Pastor Danny was my brother. I knew Pastor Danny since I was a little kid. You know, and, and uh, 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 but... My pride and my selfishness and that and that and that greed and that that wanted to get high wouldn't let me to come here. So I did what any other twenty-some-year-old man would do. I jumped in my car and I took off. And I remember driving down the street. And I showed before and I got to the stop sign past Carmelita, and I did one of those rolling stops, those California stops. And guess what? I got arrested. Why? Because I wasn't obedient to the call of the Lord. And you know, there, there's a price for sin. You know, you know, you know. There, there's a price for your action. The, the Bible says this: uh, uh, cursings or blessings, life or death. It's your choice. You choose. See, at that time, I was choosing death. I was choosing to make the, all the wrong choices. So I remember uh, um, again. I I refused to to hear the call of God. And what did it lead to? It just it just led to more void in my life. It led to 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 more substance. Which led to more incarceration, which led to more feeling alone, which led to a bigger void in my life. And then before I knew it, I just I was like in this big old cyclone, this cycle that just, you know, the more I did, the more I wanted to fill that void, but the more I did, the more that void was there. And then one day I remember in 1997, I believe it was, I found myself in front of a judge on Christmas Eve. Never in my life. Have I been in and out of that county jail so quick with the court? Who remembers going to court from the county jail or any jail? I, I, my last name is Mendoza, so I always stood there after lunch. I, ne I never got the early bus back. I never got the early bus back. Never. I, I, I did one time, and that was on Christmas Eve, 1996. Because I remember, I remember going before the judge, and, and I, I picked up a few cases, and I'm, I'm fighting the case in Downey, I'm fighting the case here in Whittier, I'm fighting the case in Norwalk, and all, and all these things are just catching up on me. All this, this void that I'm trying to avoid, it's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then I remember uh, 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 um, Pastor Danny went to court, and my father was there and all that. And I remember I was in the holding cell, and... and, and uh, Public defender, he comes to me and he goes, uh, uh, he goes, there's some people out there, they, they want to put you in this home. And I go, I know that home, you know, and it was, it was my father and Pastor Danny and all that. And to be honest, I know when I first came here, nobody wanted me in this home. They wanted me to send me to San Bernardino. They did. But it's cool, I still love you guys, amen? 
But it was because of, of the way that I know they saw me when I came here. I know they saw me taking advantage of my father. I, th I know they knew my father loved me. I knew they knew that when I came here, all I wanted was to get a few books for my dad. He walked there and get eye. And I know my dad would give it to me, though it hurt him because he loved me. In his mind, in his eyes, he was doing the right thing. And I remember the judge told me, he goes, he goes, anyways, when I went there, uh, uh, the public friend told me, he goes, there's some people up there, and this, here, here's, your, here's your offer. He goes, you can do three years in the penitentiary, or you can do a year, and at that, that time it was called On Fire Ministries. We went from New Hope to On Fire. And he goes, he goes, he walked me and he goes, I'll give you a few minutes to think about it. And I said, I don't need a few minutes. I'll do the time in prison. No, I'm playing. <laughs> I said, I don't need to think about it. I'll go to the home. Amen. That's how much of a man I was, right? Welcome home. Welcome home. <laughs> but because I've gotten in so much trouble, I still had to do a little time. So I had to do about, I think about seven or eight months I ended up doing before, before they let me out. But anyways, so I remember all that. And I remember coming to the home, not wanting to be here. Not, not knowing much. Not knowing nothing. Not knowing how to read the Bible. Not, not even knowing what the Bible was. I remember uh, uh, we used to have a thing called expounding. You remember, remember we used to expound? I don't know who came up with the word expound, but we used to come in here and we used to read the Bible and we used to have to expound on the Bible. In other words, share, share about what we got out of it. And I said, I don't think I got was bored. <laughs> I'm being honest because I didn't understand it. I didn't. But still, you know, and I, I'm here and, and, and that void is still there though. That, that, that emptiness is still there. And then I remember, I remember one day, I, I just, you know, I just started to get curious. I wanted to, to know about, about what the Lord can do. And I remember when, uh, the last time before I came to home and I was locked up, and it's weird because I shared this before too. How many know that, that the Lord knows where He's taking you and what He has in store for you? Because I remember uh, 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 I ended up in Linwood for a while. And I remember they talked about Linwood, and they said there's carpet in there, and, and you get to Linwood, you get, I, I, I picture myself like this in Linwood, watching TV, right? Well, I got to Linwood, and I watched TV through a little window like that, you know, but, but I remember me, me and my Sally, we, we, we played cards. So all we did was play cards, and we never came out of our cell just to eat, you know, and, and you know, that carpet, the only time I stepped on that carpet was when I used to go eat or when I would go shower or whatever. And, and I remember, so we played cards. We were bored. And I remember one day, um, we got a hold of this, this flyer. And I said for you, if you read, if you read um, um, five chapters of, of uh, Psalms and one chapter of Proverbs, in 30 days, you will read both entire books. So we did that. What we do is, you know, five and one is six, so I'll read a chapter, he would read a chapter, I would read a chapter, he would read a chapter, I would read a chapter, and we did that for 30 days. But I didn't realize that time. See, that was another road to the master's experience for me. The Lord began to reveal himself to me. He began to, to move. Then I came here, and I, I still didn't understand what I was doing. But I'll never forget the day, June 14, 1997. June 14, 1997 was the day that I finally just surrendered to the Lord. I said, you know what, I'm tired. I, I, I'm, try, I'm tired of trying to fill this, this emptiness that was in me. And the Lord spoke to me, and He spoke to me through Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. And it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witness to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that easily entraps us and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. And I'll be honest, you know, I, I didn't see no bright light. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't fall down and start, you know, rolling around on the ground and all that. I just kept my eyes on Jesus. That's right. And I said, Lord, if you're real, Lord, you get me through this. Lord, you know what? If you're real, you do this. 
Lord, you speak to me. You speak through me. And I begin to just make myself available. I begin to, to uh, 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 just get more curious about the Bible. I remember one time I was sitting in here and we, we had these little books we used to get from the Force for Mission Press. And it talked about the Beatitudes. And I'm looking through my Bible and I could not find Aunt B nowhere in that Bible. And I'm looking for it. And I, and I was like, where's Aunt B at? I didn't know what the Beatitudes were. And I remember Pastor Dan said, we didn't have upstairs there. That's when we had the offices downstairs. And Pastor Dan used to come in every morning and go to his office. And, and I was like, he, I was waiting for him to come. I go, I want to know what the B attitudes are because I'm looking and I can't find it. And then he told me, you know, Matthew chapter 5. And I found, oh, there's that B. And I started, but you know, it started with the, with the desire, with the hunger, with wanting to get to know the Lord. And I started praying, and Lord, use me in ministry. Man, we used to sit up these chairs, and we used to get strings. And they, for Pastor Danny, they had to be straight. I don't know if you guys remember that. But I mean, I'll be honest, the way these chairs are right now, you guys are fired, okay? Because these chairs had to be straight. I'm not lying, man. They, they had to be straight. You know, everything was cut. I mean, the beds had to be made. Your shoes, I mean, it was, you know. And I remember I said, but Lord, you know, use me. And I remember kind of like what you went through, Gilbert. Because I remember the first time, one time, I was in the home. I wasn't even in the home that long. And Pastor Danny came up to me and told me, Mark, are you going to court tomorrow? And I said, no, I'm not. He goes, yes, you are. I go, no, Pastor, I don't got no court dates. He goes, no, you're going to go to the home. You're going to represent somebody to come in the home. And I go, what? He goes, you're going to go to court, and you're going to go with the letter, and you're going to tell to get somebody to the home. And I go, what do I do? And he goes, if I was you, I go pray, buddy. <laughs> I'm serious. They, and I go, well, what? He goes, I'll follow you. I go pray. So I went and prayed, man. I went in my bunk and I prayed and I said, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. But you know what? Just because of my willingness to be obedient, the Lord, he showed me something that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. Because I remember going to this court in Orange County and I said, before I, didn't, before, I didn't even know the headquarters in Orange County. I thought Orange County was just nothing but orange girls and, you know, good, good, good people and all that, you know, because I always grew up in Alley County. I was faithful to the Alley County Jail. <laughs> right? I was. I was like, man, just, you know, it was like my second home. You know, and, and I remember going there. I went to, uh, I went to uh, the court uh, right there in Santa Ana. And I remember I was like, I had this letter and I'm showing this letter and I go and the judge calls me up there and. He asked me about the program, so I, I just shared my testimony. I shared what the Lord did for me. And I remember the judge said, okay. So he goes, uh, you have to pick him up at, at um, the ranch. I said, oh, he's at Wayside, right? So I'm thinking I'm going to Wayside, and I said, the ranch. Yeah, it's a whole, you guys, you guys, it's a whole different ranch in Orange County, yeah. I remember, so they gave me this map. I'll never forget it was a music street. Yeah, and, and so he gave me this map, and, and I drive, and I drive to this place and all that, and, and I pull up, and I think I, what reminded me was Hogan's Heroes. You know, I don't know if you guys remember Hogan's Heroes, where they, at the beginning they showed up at the car booth and they had a little wood thing goes up and down like that. I pulled up to that, <laughs> right? And, and it, was, it wasn't a deputy. I'm used to deputies. I'm used to, it was a marshal. I don't know if still there, but it was a marshal that came up to me and he goes, what do you want? And, and I go, I, I'm here to pick up this, this you know, gentleman. He's going to go into the program and I gave him the paper. And he goes, right, he took the paper, asked for my license. Now I got nervous. When he asked for my license, I got nervous because I never had a license before anyway, but now I got a license and all that. And he asked for my license, and every time a cop asked me for my name, I went to jail. Right? If I gave him my real name. So now he has my license, has my real name on it. In my mind, I'm going to jail. And now I'm going to be in jail in Orange County, and I know nothing about Orange County. And I remember he comes back, and I said, here we go, Mark. I'm getting myself, I'm serious, I'm getting myself ready to go to jail. And he comes back and, and he, he gives me my license and he gives me my pa that paper and he opens up that little thing and tells me, you see this street? He goes, you drive all the way down to the end of the street right here. He goes, at the end, very end, there's a cul-de-sac right there. He goes, pull over in the cul-de-sac, they'll bring the prisoner out to you. I was like, wow, all right. So I start driving down that street. Here I am, I'm still on probation, driving a car in a county jail, Orange County Jail. I began to cry. I began to cry because I said, Lord, you know what? I'll never doubt you again, Lord. Lord, you know what? If you tell me to go, I'm going to go, Lord. That's good. Whatever door you open up, I'm going to I'm going to go through it, Lord. It was. It didn't take long. A couple days later, I was doubting again. But I say that because you know what? For the first time in my life, for the first time of the 30, at that time I was 33 years old. That void that I've always been trying 
to feel began to be filled. That's good. See, the way I, I, I filled that void was by being obedient to what the Lord has always wanted me to do or told me to do. And say, Lord, you know what? I'm going to trust in you. I'm going to believe in you. Lord, you open that door. I'm going to go through it. I remember one time when I was in here and I was up there and, and Pastor Danny called me upstairs. As a matter of fact, it was Pastor Jesus. I just stopped him today. I called him up today. And, and, and uh, Pastor Danny needed uh, a, a printer. His printer was broken. So he called me upstairs. And at that time, I was overseeing the finances of the church. And he asked me to go buy a printer real quick. And he was talking to a pastor up there. And they were talking about, about um, <coughs> sending somebody out to Riverside. And then they go, what about Mark? And I go, what about Mark? And they go, you go to Riverside? And I go, yeah, I'll go to Riverside. I'm not lying. They came downstairs. They announced I was going to Riverside. <laughs> that, they, they came downstairs and, and I went to Riverside, not knowing what I was doing, but I was obedient to the Lord. <laughs> I'm being honest. Come on now. You know, coming back was a hard thing for me to do, but I was obedient to the Lord. See, some will see it as failure. I see it as growth. I see it as being obedient to what the Lord's calling me to do. So, you know, for the first time again, for my life, that void is being filled. And ever since then, my life, I, I, it's, it's been a series of up and downs, up, up and downs. But the Lord has blessed me to menders, to menders, to men, you know, greatly, greatly. There we go. You know, he, 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 he blessed me with the wife. I, I got married right here. You know, I have four kids. You know, and, and, and he never ceased to amaze me. I remember um, for years, like I said, that, that void was always there. And then even in here, I had a void. And I remember I, 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 for the first time in my life, I began to pray for a wife. And I remember one day I was at a Waima meeting. And we were at a restaurant on Greenleaf Boulevard and we were upstairs and we're all sitting down and we're just sitting down and, and tables, pastors at different tables and all that. And they said, whatever's on your heart, whatever you want, just voice it there at that table and have the pastors pray for you. So I, I, I said, I want a wife. I want a wife. So we prayed for a wife, but I was specific about the wife that I wanted. And these were my, what, what I wanted. One is she, she, she needed to love the Lord. She needed to love the Lord. Two, she needed to be a strong woman. Because to deal with something like this, <laughs> trust me, you need to be strong. <laughs> Because if, if you're not going through hell, I'll put you through it. And three, that she does more than I could ever imagine in service to the Lord. That's good. And the Lord gave me all three of those. He's giving me all three of those. She left, but because she, she gets mirrors when I speak. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, um, I say that because the enemy wants to lie to you. He wants to tell you, you know what, I, I, was, I was 41 when I got married. I was 40, older than you, Gil no, oh, you're about the same age, huh? Yeah, you still got more gray hair than me. <laughs> but you know what, it all started because I was willing to be obedient to the Lord. Amen. The power of your testimony. The Bible says this in Revelation chapter 12. It has come at last. Salvation and power in the kingdom of our God. In the authority of, of Christ. For the accuser of the brothers and sisters has been thrown down to the earth. To the one who accuses them before God day and night. And they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. The only thing you need to do, people, brothers and sisters are here. The only thing that, the one thing that, because I've learned this. And I, and because a lot of times we feel we don't know the, the word of God enough. If you feel like that, then get to know it. I'll say that. 
Start to read it. Start to open it up. Open, open your Bible. I made a, a, a decision this year that, that all my reading, all my studies is going to be out of the NLT. So every, everything I do this year, I'm doing out of the NLT. And I even made a decision that I'm going to try to get technical. You know, that's just something, you know, that I decided to do. I, I do prayer and all that song. But, but I want to get to know the Lord more. It's good. I want to get to know the Lord more. But here's the most powerful testimony that you could possibly have. And, and I don't want to make anybody feel bad. But other than the Lord forgiving me and loving me, other than, than uh, uh, um, Him blessing me with my wife, and my children, I think the greatest thing that I can say is this, for the past 22 years next month, That's good. next month, I don't count the time, I don't count the time when I was locked up, that's good time. I have not got nine. I have not got nine. I've, I've come close, I'm not gonna lie. I've come real close, many a times. But I'm just so thankful that every time that you know, when I've chosen or I thought about getting high, that I would hit my knees and say, Lord, take this from me. That's good. Amen. That's good. Take Amen. this from me. And to me, that is the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That He has given me the ability to stay clean and sober for 22 years next month, March. Amen. That's good. And you know what? I, I know without a doubt in my mind. People say, I'm, I'm, you know, you're arrogant or you're prideful to say that. No, I'm not. I know I serve a mighty God. That's right. That's right. That's I know right. the God that I serve has given me the ability to stay clean, and I'm going to continue to stay clean, yes, and I'm going right. to continue to grow closer to Him. Yes. Because I refuse to give up. Come on. I refuse to give in to the lies of the devil. That's good. I refuse. You know what? The, uh, there was a gentleman, I'll never forget his name, was Randy Money. He used to say this. The devil's a liar and a punk, and he wears a pink tutu. <laughs> you know what? I, I know that you know the devil has no authority over you, only that which you allow him to. Yeah, sure. And I refuse to give the devil any more authority in my life. Doesn't mean that I don't, you know, I don't go through the fire. I do. Trust me, I'm married. I go through the fire. But you know what? I refuse to give in. It's good. And when I when I'm tempted. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to a brother. I'll talk to my wife. I'll talk to a pastor. I'll talk to somebody. Pray for me. Because there's also power in prayer. Thank you and God bless you. Got two more. Getting good, huh? Yeah, that's good. Pastor John Paul. Come on up. Pastor Mark, I thought you were going to take up an offering right now. <laughs> Praise God. Well, I'm going to be quick in uh, my testimony today. Uh, many of you that are here do know somewhat of my testimony, but in 2005, I was released from state prison. You know the old saying, many of us have heard it before, Tore up from the floor up. I needed a check up from the neck up. I was beat up from the feet up. I was actually referred here to the Daniel Alvarez Center. Back then it was called the Men's Home. And um, I did some time in prison. And um, I was around a group of individuals who always, we'd always push the Bible away. I remember back in my old neighborhood, we used to actually used to chase out the evangelists from Victory Outreach when they used to come in to my neighborhood to preach the gospel. But in 2005, I remember uh, there was actually uh, someone there, uh, doing like a prayer group. And I had high points and I really don't know how I... Sorry about that. I had high points and... I really don't know how I ended up in um, the gym at that time. And the guy that was leading the prayer circle, he was actually a backsliding Christian. And I remember sitting down with him and him telling me something. He said, man, you know, I was doing incredible things for God, but I stepped away. 
And he goes, man, I wish I could get back to how I used to be. And at that time, he was running the yard. And I remember every night, he used to do a prayer circle, and I never got involved in it. But I remember uh, being in my bunk, and I remember like putting the covers over me. And I remember a lot of my homeboys coming to my house, you know, saying, hey, you know what, John Paul, I know one day your life is going to change. And these guys were running around my neighborhood, but accepted Christ and their life had changed. And I remember pulling the blankets over my head and saying, you know, God, I've seen so many other people get this miracle in their life. If, if you're for real, my life will change. Well, at this time, there was some things that were over me. 38 days later, I was released. I ended up going right here to the pro office off a of shoemaker. I don't know if it's still there. This is 2005. I remember my pro officer was out. I remember my mom, she's like, Mijo, just do one thing. Go check in with your pro officer. And then after that, she's like, you're on your own. So I remember I went and checked in and I was like, I'm gonna go check in, go check in. And then my mom's got a car. She's gonna go take me to the connection, drop me off, I'm gonna get loaded. I already had everything all planned out. I remember she gave me this number and she was and she told me she said you know what this is the office of the day if you're tired and if you're really tired of, of doing what you do John then you'll call this number and I remember um, my mom jumping on the freeway with me and I remember for some reason we went the wrong way and I remember the Lord spoke to me. Listen, you got to hear me when I say this, that nobody in my family was a Christian. Nobody. I was in sin, had never accepted Christ, never done none of that stuff. But the Lord spoke to me and I heard his voice. And he had told me this, for the wages of sin is death. This fear came over me. I started crying in the car. My mom's like, what's wrong with you, John? I'm like, I don't know, but if I go back, I feel like something bad's going to happen to me. Pull over. And this is before we had, this is like a long time ago, cell phone. We didn't have a cell phone or nothing like that. So she pulled over. I remember using a pay phone. I remember making a call. And I remember, <clears throat> I remember uh, then picking up the phone. And I said, you know, I have this number. I'm not a Christian, but do you guys have space? And they said, you know what, brother? We're full, but for you, we'll make space. And I remember I came to the home, and I remember they led me to the back, and I seen a weight pile. And I was just like, man, just like home, just like prison. And then I went inside, and I seen double bunks. So I was just like, man, it's like being back in prison again. This is okay. And then I remember something. Two guys that were in the home had asked me if I've ever accepted Christ. They took me to the back and they said a prayer with me. And let me tell you something. It wasn't until three months later till I completely surrendered my life to God when I was in this home. I was here chucking and jiving. My best friend My best friend that <clears throat> was here with me, little Danny, came to me one day and he told me, he said, you know what, John? Aren't you tired? Aren't you tired of going back to the same old same? He goes, if you're tired, John, just, just give in. So I remember that day we both came in here. We sat at this altar. And we pray. And I said, God, if you're for real, then you'll change my life. And at that time, my life started changing. I started praying. I started reading. I started giving Bible studies. Number one, 
The Lord had showed me when I was in the home how important prayer is. That's the first thing he showed me. How important prayer is. And he gave me this about prayer. He says prayer is people ready all year. Prayer, gentlemen, is your umbilical cord to heaven. It establishes our relationship and our dependence on God. That's what prayer is. Number two was reading your word. That's what the home showed me. What does reading your word do? In Romans 12, 1 and 2, it says it renews your mind. It renews your mind. So what does the Bible do for me? I have six things that it does for me. These will be quick. Number one, it inspires me. Number two, it spoke truth to me about me. Number three, it taught me. Number four, it rebuked me. Number five, it trained me. And number six, it transforms me. And the last thing the home did for me was taught me how to submit to those that are, are, are in authority that are above me. I had a lot of trouble with submitting to anybody. But this is something that the Lord showed me in the home. The Bible taught me that those that are in position are, part, are, are put there to pray for me and to watch over my soul. Our pastors. Our overseer. They're put there for a purpose. Amen. To pray for you and to watch over your soul. Amen. This is what submission meant to me. About the seventh or eighth month when I was here in the home, the Lord spoke to me. And I remember Pastor Danny pulling me to the side and sitting me down. And he told me, he said, John Paul, you have a call in your life. He said, you're going to preach the gospel one day and you're going to be a pillar in the church. And I told Pastor Danny, I'm still trying to figure out if I'm really saved or not. And you're telling me I'm going to preach one day? But what he had spoken to me stood with me. It stood in my spirit. The home did a lot for me. It did those things I'm talking about. I have an incredible job. I have an incredible wife. In a local church in Whittier, I usher. I armor bear for my pastor. And I'm on the pastoral staff at Destiny Community Church. We're walking the call of God to restore, rebuild, and raise up a generation of those that are in the city of Whittier. Come on. This is what the home has done for me. The same thing it's done for me is the same thing, gentlemen, that it can do for you. Amen. God bless you. God. Maybe you guys getting ministered to. Yeah. In the book of Job it says, do not despise small beginnings. That's right. For greater is what's going to come to you. Amen. Our last speaker is uh, Pastor David, your senior pastor here. Come on. myself and keep myself from not preaching because I want to stay with the <laughs> with the direction of where I came from. Amen? Yeah. Um, before I came to the home, 
I was 30 years old. I was married for 10 years. I had three kids. They were about seven, eight, and 10 years old. My story is a little more different. I, I was addicted to drugs, but mine was, I was a function addict, and it was hard to see that I had a problem. Um, my addiction started when I was 11 years old. So here I'm 30 years old. I'm drinking about two and a half cases of beer a day, smoking about 20 joints, and doing a full eight ball meth daily for about two years. Uh, I didn't know if I was coming and going. And the problem was it seemed normal because everybody I worked with was doing the same thing. Uh, my wife, there was days that she said I didn't come home. I came home, the problem was I got out of work at 10 in the morning. I wouldn't get home until like 9 at night. And then I would go in the garage, basically just open the door and say I'm home, and then go in the garage, continue to party, maybe come in and lay down and get a cat nap for maybe 15, 20 minutes, and then go back to work. And that was my life for a puppy. Like I said, about two years. But it started getting really to the point where we started fighting. We were arguing really bad. See, and I had things. I had the house already, I had the cars, I had the family. But see, the whole time I thought it was the addiction. You know, I thank you, Pastor, for putting this in order because studying and praying and asking God where I came from before I came to the home and what the home did for me and then where he's taking me. It opened up a lot of scriptures to me. It opened a lot of different things that even sometimes I believe we get backwards. You know, we're, oh, we're here for our addiction. No, you're here to get a relationship with Christ. Yeah. You're here to get delivered. You're here to get healed. Yeah. And sometimes we'll just go through the sobriety of it. And I think a lot of times that's how it, it was taught. You know, I don't want to get off track, but basically every, everything you were hearing here was part of a man that was a spiritual dad to us. That's why you kept yeah. hearing Pastor Danny. Pastor yeah. Danny told us this. He, he, he tested us. He, he threw us in things yeah. without even telling us we were going to do it. Yeah. I was one of those too. <laughs> but he tested us. But he was a spiritual father to us. You know, and you, you can hear it in everybody's testimony and how he meant to us. Amen? Uh, I miss him deeply. <clears throat> but, so I came to a point where I got arrested. Uh, my marriage was on the rock. I'm going to get, we're facing a divorce. We're agreeing a divorce because we we're just at a point where we're fighting every night. I've shared this before. And the real part where I realized I was, I was really bad was when I, I went to my parents' house one day to pick up my kids. And David must have been about 9 or 10. And he said, we're not going home with you. We're tired of you. And we don't want to see you guys fight. And that's right there and then I knew there was something wrong. It hit my heart so hard that my own kids didn't want to come home. So that night, I had, she didn't come home. I didn't come home. And I had a weekend that was just, I probably would have committed suicide. I probably had did a whole eight ball that whole night. I was, I was out. I was, believe me that I was, repairing a roof in my house, cutting the roof because I was tweaking so bad. Uh, somebody called the cops. I got arrested for being an influence. Uh, later on, I come to find out that it was my wife to call. Uh, probably the smartest thing she could have ever done. So I came to the Lord that, that day I got out of jail. I came to the Lord in 1995, June the 10th. I celebrate that very much. It's my spiritual birthday. The very next day, I came into the program. <clears throat> when I came into the program, I had no idea what I was doing. I had, had no faith. I didn't really, was, I was raised as a Catholic because I was told I was Catholic, but I really never went to church, never practiced it, never read a Bible. So I had no idea when I came here what was going to happen. Um, I really didn't even think I, I had a problem. I just thought I made some mistakes. Like I said, it was pretty normal. Everybody I hang around with used drugs. So it seemed pretty normal. But there was a lot of, a lot of uses in my life. I didn't know how to read. I was on a literate. Didn't know how to spell. I didn't know how to read. Uh, there was a brother Jimmy here back then. About a week later, he took me under his wing and started showing me how to read and showing words out. And Larry, this is what became my education. It was the Word of God, my reading. It became my diploma. It became my college. Amen? Yeah. And, uh, but when I was here, when I came in, I, I also had a, a hand problem. They had a cast on me and it wasn't getting healed. I had a whole year with this cast on. I also had about, a, about two or three months before I came in the home where I tried to get off myself, off of meth. I went five days without using them. It felt like somebody was sticking needles in my body. And uh, I relapsed. I couldn't do it. 
So when I came to the program, those are the things that the Lord revealed to me that really has helped me, was what he took me out of what I could build on. And I didn't see some of this. You don't see it right away. You don't see it like when you're really going through it. You know? Um, but my hand, a whole year, wasn't... They had just took the cast off right before I came into the home. Like maybe two or three days before. And, um... Uh, whole year wasn't getting healed, was hurting. Within a week, I couldn't move my hand. As soon as, as soon as they started praying over me, all these things started taking place in my life. Immediately. My hand literally never bothered me again. After a whole year going through all these problems, not moving it, I had a surgery and it just wasn't healing. You know why I wasn't healing, right? Because I wouldn't stop using meth. You know what it does to healing process, right? But literally, the Lord healed me. I never had a problem with my hand. Never hurt. I didn't even get sick from detoxing. I had got so wasted that weekend before I got arrested. I had, I probably, that was probably my worst week. I probably had a seven day straight that I, I stood up and I didn't even detox from it. The Lord, I didn't even get sick. <coughs> Amen? Amen? So as I'm here, but I learned to build on these things. I started, my wife, to me, she was filing a divorce. It took about two or three weeks for her to walk in here on the weekend service. And now we're, we're still married. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, in April, will be 35 years that we've been married. Oh, good. So, that was David being lost. But I thought I was here for an addiction problem. Even when I left the program, I only did three months, even when I left the program. I didn't go thinking that I was an alcoholic. I didn't think I had a drug problem. It was in Romans when I started revealing, because I was that person that had that poison in my tongue. Things could be peaceful at home, and I could get there, I, man, I'd leave a mess. But it wasn't me, it was the drugs behind me. But then also I started realizing that it wasn't. See, the, the root of the, your addiction, your bondage, it comes from sin. So it really wasn't that, oh, God created me to be an alcoholic. No, it was the pride I had. It was the sin deeper in me that created a lot of these things. God didn't create me to be a, an addict. It was the frustration, it was my pride, it was my lying, it was my uh, irresponsibility of being a father, of irresponsibility of stepping into being a husband. Those were the things that led me to use and do the things I did. There's more root to our addiction. A lot of times, oh, wow. I just, uh, why did you become an alcoholic? Oh, I had a lot of, a lot of time on my hands. No, there's more to it. Pastor Mark was sharing about voids that we try to fill. A lot of times we do these things. So I started realizing that, because we, we had some overseers back when I was in the home, that I didn't understand how they were overseers. Directors. I had to, uh, was Pastor Ben back then. Director, he was a uh, Pastor Ben. Well, he became a pastor after, but he was just a director. Man, he'd scream and holler at me all the time. And I had no idea why he was overseer. But, you know, God knows what we need at the time. I was so hard-headed and stubborn that if he wouldn't have hollered at me the way he hollered at me, Come I probably would have never understood it. Oh, you. See, God knows what he's doing. I didn't understand it. I won't treat somebody like that. But I need it. God knows what we need, amen? And so coming to the home, I did a lot of things when I, when I left the program. I mean, I took it serious. That was one thing about the program. I, I did take the program serious. I needed to learn. We prayed a lot. We probably don't even pray near as much as we used to pray here. But we prayed a lot. And now they, I think we've got to cut back to 25 minutes. But we, we had our time prayers before. Yeah. And I took that home with me. I took that home with me and I didn't understand really why I was doing some of the things I was doing. I did get taught here that. Try to pray for a serious straight for a whole hour every day. It could get boring for a while. You, can't, you, you lose track. But I can't. I used to do that. When I left the program, I said, I want to take this serious. And I would come home from work. I'd play my music in the living room. The kids would be ready to go to school. And I'd find a couch, man. And I'd just plant in that couch. And I'd pray. And I'd seek the Lord, man. And I'd pray every day for an hour. And I did that for probably about two and a half years at home. Couldn't understand. But he knew the things that I was going to go through. He knew the things I was going to go through. And that's what the home, that's 
John Paul was saying that that's one of the things that the home really taught me a lot was to seek him, to pray, and everything, to acknowledge him in everything. And doing that, he's opened my eyes. He's opened my eyes to see every time he moves to something. You know, it's really blessed to be here with all the, with Gail hearing him. You know, it brings so many memories back. Amen? So many things. I remember when we put that trailer back there. I remember when we, we had to haul it in there. We, we had to figure out how many jacks we had to take to get that thing in there just for this guy to live in there and the other people that were living in it too. But we went to so many different things in this program. You know, we've been here where we watched the church grow from 22 people to like over 200. Like in a period of five years. It was so amazing to see the hand of God move in this church. Amen? So the home taught me quite a bit of things. I learned to become Brother David. At first I didn't understand Brother David. What are you calling brother for? <laughs> you know? Um, so I went from being all these nicknames in the road, coming to the home, getting called Brother David. And then what's, what's happening after leaving the home? Well, I'm going to say now I got 12, about 12 years that I started directing the home. That was a miracle. Um, but those are doors, as they were saying, that opens up. There were so many doors that I was just being obedient, as Pastor Mark was saying, was that when the doors open, you can't be fearful. You have to learn to walk through those doors. And I was obedient to that. I walked through those doors, and, you know, many times we were going to get licensed, me and my wife, and, you know, we'd, paperwork would get lost. And it was it's so easy to get discouraged and say, man, you know, I'm tired of this, I'm not going to do it. And, um, uh, we had processed our paperwork, oh my God, probably, probably right around 12 years ago. And it literally took about seven years for, I need to finally get licensed to Forster because they kept using our paperwork. I got licensed through, I got ordained through uh, Cornerstone. So it took a process. So I got about 12 years that I was directing the home. Right now I got five years that I've been ordained and now that I've been pastoring the home, amen? But there are just blessings that the Lord, that when those doors get open, the Lord, are you going to walk through them? Yeah. Are you ready? Are you going to have the faith to be able to love? To do it for Christ? Not expecting anything back in return? That's right. I love watching the men's lives change. I really do. It's amazing. Yeah. I've seen so many men. You know, I was trying to get some numbers just to show you guys some of the vision. But uh, you, in May, it will be 25 years that the program's been here. Amen. A lot of years. We're actually trying to do our banquet in June 29th. June the 29th, we're trying to do a banquet here. So you uh, pay attention. You know, we'll announce it. Hopefully you guys can join us. But we would like to do that. Get a live band here. Play some worship music. And just really give God glory. Amen? Amen. But 25 years is a lot to be celebrated. Now, one time we, 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 were, we were averaging 30 to 40 men per month. That's how many people were just coming through here at one time. It, it, it was hectic. So many men coming through here. So I average about 500 men per year. Figure that out, 25 years. 15,000 men that have been through here. Wow. Now I'm not saying every person's been committed to God, but what does the Bible tell us? That his word would not go void. So as long as we recited the, the sinner prayer in their life, and we continue to instill the word of God, that's a lot of men. 15,000 men. Started by Pastor Danny. That's right. Kyle acknowledged um, Mark's dad, Eddie. He was actually the one who took me to court. It was Pastor Mark's um, dad, Eddie. Uh, so there's so many men that had a part to play in this program. Amen? Uh, we don't go to church here no more. We go to church at the crossing. Now we have two buildings, which is a blessing. Amen? So I'm going to share a little bit about where I feel the vision is at. Right now, we're trying to learn to promote the home a lot more in different ways because, see, without a rotation, the rotation allows the other men to go to work, start saving. We try to do a 10 10 80 plan, which Pastor Danny started many, many years ago. And I, I just, we started it and then we kind of fell off of it. And now we're back on it. We're trying to teach it better, 10 10 80. So when the men leave, if they come in here and they're doing nine months to one year, they're just not leaving with the savings, with, with money. But trying to live, live, leave with being able to get an apartment. Yeah. Being able to take another brother with them. Iron sharpens iron. Amen? Yeah. Especially with everything, the way the cost is going up. 
But a man can act with the way the $15 of uh, minimum wage is supposed to be going, we have to teach the 10, 10, 80 even better. Because a person can leave probably with four to five thousand dollars within a period of six months. If they come in here and they try to do a nine-month program, we try to get them to sign a contract and they commit themselves for another six months. So they're doing a complete year. But in, so in six months they're committed to the program, six months they're doing a working program. If they're doing a 10, 10, 80, they can save almost a little over half of their paycheck, they can walk out with anywhere from five to six thousand dollars. Now, the only problem is you got to make sure that God is first in their life. Because give five, six thousand dollars to somebody that's not delivered. Let me say that again. That's not delivered from their addiction. What do you think is going to happen? See, we want them to be a new creation, and sometimes those things don't go right. So, but these are the visions that we're, that we're we're seeking. We're asking the Lord. Get a better rotation on it, and so men can see on. Um, go to work and have a better opportunity to live a better life out there. Amen. Amen. Let's see if I covered everything. You know what? Come on up, honey. Pastor Richard said she wanted, he wanted you to show the vision. Come on up. She goes, Amen. You know, and it's awesome to hear these testimonies, what God has done in this home, but we have to also remember what God is not just doing to these men's lives, but to the men, their family. Amen. Because Amen. when he was in the center, uh, I too was coming and I would tell him, okay, what, what, what are you learning? What, what, what are you studying? I want it. Give it to me. You know, I never was in a home. I ran two women's home, which I'll never do again. Men are easier to work with. <laughs> but, you know what, I, I grabbed what they were teaching here because I want a part of it. I wanted to learn. I, I consider myself homegrown too um, because I learned what, the, what they were learning, I was learning. I would take it home, I would study it on his, um, you tell you guys have it easy because he would have to do a Bible study uh, right out of Bible studies to get a pass. Um, now these days you guys already know what your passes are, but we might be some changes. Oh. Um, <laughs> but it, 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 you know, he would sit there and he would, okay, I got to do my, my essay so I can get my pass. And so we both would sit there and study. We were, and it brought us closer to a point where we were both learning. We were both growing. God is doing great things. And God is doing great things in this center. Um, seeing these men, what, what God is doing in their lives and um, the changes that are taking place, but also those that came through here, what God is doing. You know, you don't always stay here. You move on. God moves you somewhere else. Because God wants you to grow somewhere else. And when you're growing somewhere else, then you're teaching somewhere else. And when you're teaching somewhere else, the gospel is going that's to right. the ends of the earth. Because that's, that's right. what he called us to do, right? right? He called us to the end of the earth to share the gospel. And that's what we're doing. Everybody's in different places, but we all came from the same place. We all started here. We all started here at uh, uh, New Hope, uh, Off Fire Ministry. Action Academy, and now finally we're leaving it at the Daniel Alvarez Center, the man who started everything, the one who had a vision that got placed, and God used him in a mighty way. And now we're carrying that legacy on because what God did in his life at a men's home in Santa Ana, he brought it over here to Whittier. Yeah. That's right. And now we're going to let that legacy continue to grow to see what God's going to do and send. I, I've always said this. I see missionaries. I see pastors. I see evangelists. I see men of God. I see husbands. I see fathers that are going to go out there and they're going to share the gospel. They're going to go out there and they're going to go on fire. You know, we should have kept the name on fire because that's what we're about. We're about going out and setting a fire of the Holy Spirit into the communities where God is going to send us. So you got to remember... I always tell you guys this. You're not here just on purpose. 
God has a plan. He has a vision. Come on. Are we ready to step in and do what God has called us to do? Come on. Amen. Amen.